Happy Saturday. We are here at Burning Man 2011. I am Phil Osophical, and this is my friend Michael Garfield. He is an amazing visionary artist and thinker and philosophizer who I met at a festival in Ohio called Rootwire. And here we are at Burning Man. He's one of the sparks which uh, which inspired me to come here, knowing that he was gonna be here and seeing his, which way are we going? We both yeah, have to- Two o'clock in G. Two o'clock in G. We're all the way down here. We're walking the crazy playa right now, and there's uh, we both have to pee, so we're both experiencing a non-ordinary state of consciousness. It's pretty, induced, pretty ordinary, indu really. Right. Induced by massively overflowing bladders and lack of restrooms. Um, and here we have some techno dance music. But um, as we often do, we'll have a little tri triangular conversation here. Well, we'll talk, but we'll also talk to you. And uh, first, let's dance to this music. Hey, everybody! So, my question for Michael here is... How did you decide to devote your all your life energy towards this magical revolution of evolution consciousness? What was it that made you kind of take the jump from the status quo into this crazy realm where we have things like Thunderdome? Yeah, well, let's step out a little further from the stage speakers. Yes, right? and I'll do this. Wow, that is a sweet bike with antlers on the front. Holy cow. So many antlers this year. <laughs> okay, so to answer your question, um, I had graduated in 2005 with a degree from the University of Kansas in ecology and evolutionary biology. Yes. And uh, uh, the last year that I was in school, my interest shifted from digging up dinosaurs to the role of language, mind, and imagination in the evolutionary process. Yes. You know, communication and experience. And so, I, uh... I think there's bathrooms down this way. I had a little <laughs> trouble... We still have to pee really bad. I had a little trouble actually getting um, acquainted enough with this discipline, which is, you know, massively multidisciplinary and involves uh, the philosophy of science, as well as, um, you know, science, sciences and humanities across the board, chaos theory, uh, cognitive neuroscience, and uh, I, the more I looked, the more I realized that I had no idea how to even begin to try and find a program that would allow me to get a PhD in this kind of freewheeling stuff. My, my professors, you know, told me, you know, uh, straight up, you can't do this. Yeah. Um, this would require an interdisciplinary panel of at least half a dozen different advisors, and you're going to have to teach them how to speak each other's languages. Uh -huh. And honestly, this project is stupidly ambitious. Uh -huh. It is the kind of thing that somebody only takes on once they have tenure. It's not profitable, eh? It's, 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 uh, it's hard to sell to a graduate advisor because it is so vast in its scope. They want something that's small and manageable and uh -huh. can show like, uh, you know, really discrete results after, you know, two or three years. Uh -huh. But um, what I wanted to do is a survey of the literature and a comparative analysis of the ways that these different disciplines have talked about the emergence of complexity, yeah. you know, like order from chaos. But um, even that was kind of regarded as as uh, too much, and it, it wasn't. It was still kind of inchoate in my mind. It wasn't properly formed yeah. in such a simple way. Uh, so I fell out of the university system. Mm -hmm. uh, temporarily was in a program offered by the John F. Kennedy University in, in California. That this is a program they no longer offer, unfortunately, yeah. on integral theory, um, uh -huh. following work of people like uh, Harvard's Robert Keegan and independent scholar Ken Wilber. Uh -huh. And it was, a, it was a program in how to, how to correlate various methodologies and, and various in, you know, uh, 
dimension perspectives yeah. in human inquiry. Not so specialized as the university system is. Right. I mean, it was ultimately my, my undergraduate advisor told me, you cannot specialize in synthesis. And uh -huh. I said, you're wrong. And then went on to find the only program in the world that I am aware of that allowed it. And I think that this is an idea whose time has come, yeah. but it might be a couple of years before it's really understood and fully implemented by the university system. Yeah. You know, the more knowledge we have, the more we need connections between those specialized sub-disciplines, and the more we do need people who specialize in synthesis. It's the same yeah. as you know, why the exp exponential explosion of information with the internet created search engines and yeah. Wikipedia. You know, the, the you know, an increasingly interconnected world requires a new class of intermediaries yeah. in order to filter and properly translate that knowledge between domains. Totally. So it oh, sounds look at it, it's a dinosaur skeleton. Whoa, dinosaur skeleton. So what happened is that you know, I was still I didn't really know how to translate this into an actual career still. Uh-huh. Hands up. Uh, Almost hit by bike. Let's go this way, huh? Oh, there's bathrooms right oh, there. there are, okay. Well, just to interrupt you for one moment to put this into my kind of uh, vocabulary, it sounded like, like, like Michael, your uh, reality tunnel was kind of more, it was wider than most people's in this disciplinary system. Most people were looking at everything through one specific lens and you were kind of like shifting, looking, trying on different pairs of gog of perceptual spectacles, as I like to call them. And uh, I was learning to do so. Uh -huh. And I was, at the time, suffering from a real crisis of purpose because I had spent my entire life through looking through only one lens. Exactly, yeah. And suddenly, yeah. suddenly, right before I get my degree, that's no longer sufficient. Yeah. It's no longer satisfying to me. Kind you of know? the glasses we were born with. Right. So, I mean, basically what ended up happening was that, you know, through the, the circumstances of, you know, the Bush administration's gouging of educational funding, uh -huh. the job that I had as a scientific illustrator at the Natural History Museum in Lawrence, Kansas, could not afford to pay me a living wage. Uh -huh. And I uh, ended up following my heart out to Boulder, Colorado, where I had uh, spent my summer vacations as a child uh -huh. and uh, had no idea how I was going to apply my education and didn't really care. I figured I just needed to live somewhere with a greater quality of life, easier yeah. access to nature. And when I did that, I got a job at a, a local shoe store. I got laid off from that shoe store. <laughs> and I, at that point, I had uh, nothing better to do than to explore and increasingly dedicate myself to my various creative projects. Uh -huh. um, you know, Charles Eisenstein in The Ascent of Humanity talks yeah, about how yeah. the job crisis is actually something, it has a silver lining. Yeah. Because suddenly, these people who, have ne who haven't even had recess, they haven't had free time, they haven't in many ways ever really learned who they are except the role that they fulfill in in pursuing and executing the orders of uh, yeah, you know, some executive being structure. a cog in the system. Yeah, that suddenly all of these men are laid off, and once they're through the nightmare of the you know the existential crisis of having lost their external imported purpose, yeah, then they suddenly discover that there are certain things that they enjoy doing. Exactly. And, and they start to cultivate those things, <laughs> and then they realize that other people value those things exactly. because the things that we do with our passions are oftentimes the things that are most required by our communities. Exactly. You know, so it, so basically, it, it's just it, chance, really. And I fell into it, and luckily through a series of of at the time, what seemed like unfortunate catastrophes, you know, the slings and arrows. But ultimately, I mean, I'm by no means, a, you know, a shining success. I still live in my car, you know. <laughs> I, I, I can't it's afford, I can't afford a cell phone. Brother. It's very you know, inspirational. Thank you. But I, it's, it's, uh, you know, it is an experiment in, in uh, a lifestyle of, of my own device and not the lifestyle that my parents uh, suggested. You know, the, the, I'm not wearing the clothes that they bought for me anymore. Yeah, well, it's very inspirational, brother. And I will post some links to Michael's work. It is profoundly inspiring, and uh, he's really doing amazing things. And basically, the answer to this whole question is that the way... The way to the way to break out of our current crises is to follow our passions and our hearts desires and really engage our gifts which is exactly what Michael is doing and inspiring many people including myself 
And so thank you so much, yeah. brother. Your heart's smart too, it's not just your brain. And your gut's smart too, it's not just your heart. You know, be, uh, be aware of all the different ways that you can listen to your, your body and your mind and, and all the different kinds of intelligences that we all have to draw upon. And uh, you're going to have an easier time navigating in an increasingly complex reality uh, than if you try to think your way through it. <laughs> so. And nice. here we are at the porta potties. Hooray! Uh, I pissed my way through it. Yes, yes. Have a beautiful day. Michael Garfield, I'll put some links to his stuff. Peace and love here at Burning Man 2011. Fuck.